Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the ICFJ Global Health Crisis Reporting Forum and our ongoing webinar series connecting experts to journalists around the world to discuss developments during the COVID-19 pandemic. If you don't know me yet, I'm Stella Roque, Director of Community Engagement at the International Center for Journalists in Washington, DC. A reminder to the people tuning in, if you have questions during this discussion, please post them on the Zoom chat or in the comments of the Facebook live stream in the forum group. It's my honor today to introduce Professor Gabriel Leung, a leading epidemiologist and Dean of Medicine at the University of Hong Kong. Gabriel is the inaugural Helen and Francis Zimmern Professor in Population Health and holds the Chair of Public Health Medicine at the University of Hong Kong. He is an elected member of the US National Academy of Medicine and was awarded the Gold Bohemia Star, the second highest civilian honor by the Hong Kong government for distinguished service in protecting and promoting population health. His research has defined the epidemiology of three novel viral epidemics, namely SARS in 2003, influenza A, H7N9 in 2013, and most recently COVID-19. He, he led the Hong Kong government's efforts against the pandemic uh, A, H1N1 in 2009. Thank you so much for joining us today, Gabriel. It's truly an honor to have someone of your expertise to help us understand the outlook for this pandemic. Um, for the upcoming year. So to begin my discussion with you, we want to discuss a bit about the current status of the pandemic and also some clarification of the facts thus far of what we know about the spread of COVID-19. So for the sake of our audience, we define a pandemic as the spread of a new virus all over the world. Given that we're now seeing a second wave of infections across Europe, could you tell us a bit about whether this virus has become endemic now. And perhaps you could explain to the audience the difference, uh, the difference to us between those terms and why or why not, in your opinion. Well, a pandemic means that it's a usually a new emerging infectious disease that sweeps globally. Uh, and that's really what a pandemic is. Uh, and of course, we've been living through one since January this year, and it's not likely to fade away um, or settle into any kind of endemic equilibrium until there is a safe and effective vaccine uh, that is widely accessible and therefore um, inoculated um, worldwide. And that's really what we're looking at. So I think we're probably um, at the halfway mark of this very, very long uh, marathon. I see. One question we had received in previous webinars um, with other health experts is what is the connection between weather and the spread of COVID-19? A recent piece in the New York Times headlined that Europe and the US confront spiking cases as temperatures dip. We're familiar with flu season, for example, but why would we be more vulnerable to rising COVID-19 infection rates in the winter rather than the summer? And are countries on the global equator less likely to see the same spike due to warmer weather? I think what we're seeing um, in Europe and in North America is that as these Northern Hemisphere countries are going into the uh, winter months, you are seeing what we call seasonal forcing. That is the seasonal factors of temperature and humidity giving viruses generally, but including SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, a little bit more um, sort of activity either by being more viable for a slightly longer period of time on surfaces or making it easier to spread. And that you see with a lot of respiratory viruses. And that's why we see quite a bit of uh, activity, usually for influenza, but also, for example, with RSV, res uh, respiratory syncytial virus, and indeed the four seasonal human coronaviruses. 
So that seasonal forcing is what we fear. And if COVID-19 turns out to be similar, then you can expect a little bit of a seasonal kick. However, because this is sweeping through the world and that we are nowhere near so-called the herd immunity threshold, um, the number of susceptible people out there is actually the biggest determinant of prop propagation or continuing propagation of the infection. I see. As an epidemiologist, just to remind the audience here what epidemiologists do, your expertise is the incidence, distribution, and possible control of a disease. As of this date, what do we know for certain about how COVID-19 spreads? And what measures have been proven effective at stopping the spread? We know that the most likely routes of transmission are by large droplets and by fomites, that is touching uh, contaminated surfaces and then touching your um, uh, nose, your eyes, your mouth, and therefore getting infected. We also know with reasonable confidence, although not with absolute proof, but reasonable evidence uh, that suggests aerosol spread, that is airborne transmission, especially in certain settings. And so all these three are possible or even probable routes of transmission. And we do know also that face masks probably works by reducing the risk of infection maybe 10%, 20%, 30%, again, depending on the setting. And if I tell you that there is a drug uh, that would prophylactically protect you by reducing your chances of getting infected by 20, 30%, I think that you would probably take it. So that's why I think that based on the precautionary principle, based on the likely protection that could be afforded you by a face mask and with very, very, very rare exceptions, uh, there is almost no downside risk to wearing a mask. So that's why I think that that would be the smart thing to do. Excellent, thank you. Could you tell us a bit about how this pandemic compares with the SARS epidemic and why SARS didn't turn into a pandemic? There seems to be a common story being told that SARS simply disappeared on its own. What's your view on that story? Well, uh, SARS didn't disappear on its own. Uh, it required quite a lot of public health effort to drive it back into the natural reservoirs. So I think that we need to stop comparing different epidemics or different outbreaks because they are very unique and they really other than the name and the species itself, that is both are coronaviruses, they have very little resemblance to one another. And I think that it probably misleads more than it actually adds value. And here is the main reason why SARS um, actually was no comparison in terms of the disease burden, uh, in, in terms of comparison with, with COVID-19. Um, SARS had a recorded global case count in total of just under 9,000. In the US alone, in a day, you probably get four times that number as of today. So every day, the US records five times or four times that total case count of SARS. So it's, it's, it's completely different and it's on very different orders of magnitude. And the main reason is because of the way it spreads. So for uh, SARS, usually it doesn't spread from the infected person to a secondary case somewhere between day five to day seven after the index person first experiences symptoms. Whereas for COVID, 
you start spreading probably a day or two before you have any symptoms to the extent that maybe 30-40% of secondary infection happens before you even experience symptoms yourselves and you probably are most infectious at the, at the time that you first notice and show symptoms. And that's why it is so difficult to prevent because you aren't even aware that you are sick yourself. So even if you were the kindest, the most responsible person on earth, unless you take universal precautions, that is you wear a mask and you go out universally 100% of the time, um, and unless you are really, really very, very um, adherent to hand hygiene and avoid crowded places and keep physical distancing, it's very, very difficult to stop the spread. And that's really, um, I think, is the main driver of the key difference between these two epidemics 17 years apart. I see. Now, you had mentioned herd immunity earlier in this discussion. The WHO um, recently gave a very public thumbs down to the herd immunity strategy. Its director calling the approach immoral and scientifically and ethically problematic. Do you agree with that criticism? Why or why not? And importantly, what do you think needs to be done that's not being done right now to stop COVID-19 from spreading at its current rate or to stem second wave infections? I think that I'll leave your viewers um, with this response. Um, what you just summarized is essentially what was uh, in the Great Barrington Declaration. Um, and in today's Lancet, um, there is a, a ripost uh, called the John Snow Memorandum. And I think that that correspondence called the John Snow Memorandum in the Lancet uh, very succinctly summarizes the evidence uh, and it is something to which I very much subscribe. So now let's kind of talk about the future of this pandemic. Given that every country has their own public health responses to COVID-19, some more successful than others, do you think without a vaccine in the near future, there's any hope of us stamping this virus in any way? Well, first of all, let me just address the vaccine question. I think that the first generation vaccines that we're, we are about to see launched formally and receiving approval, and I'm quite confident that there will be at least half a dozen of these uh, uh, vaccine candidates that will make it through final regulatory approval and therefore be ramped up for production and then hopefully would get into the arms of uh, the majority of the world's population. But the first generation vaccines, with the possible exception of one that I'm aware of, none of them actually provide sterilizing immunity. That is, they probably would not stop transmission. They probably won't prevent you from getting infected to begin with. But what they would do is they would probably protect you from dying of COVID or being hospitalized for serious complications arising from your infection. So I think they would take the severity edge off the disease, but the vast majority of them uh, will not actually protect you from getting infected and therefore from passing it on to others. So it is probably not going to be the silver bullet that many are hoping for, but I think that it is so necessary to have it to protect especially those who are first and foremost at very high risk of falling ill and falling very seriously ill, possibly dying from it. So these would be frail older adults, especially those with chronic conditions. Equally importantly, we need to protect those who may be young and who may be healthy, but who have a very large probability or chance of getting infected. These are the frontline workers. These are the frontline healthcare workers. These are the frontline essential workers in society who, because of their jobs, need to be exposed disproportionately uh, compared to the, to, to, to the rest of us, their peers. And so they also need to be protected. 
And so that's why I think the first generation vaccines, while not perfect, are going to be very useful. Now that said, um, that's not going to stop completely um, the pandemic in its tracks, but it will allow us return to some new normality. Um, and I think that we need to figure out ways of living with this virus, at least in the short to medium term, and assume that it is not going to be driven back into the wild from where it probably came. So let's assume the best case scenario, a COVID-19 vaccine will be developed and approved, and let's hope knock on wood by 2021. Well, but, but even if a vaccine is developed, it's been reported that to produce and distribute a vaccine globally will take a lot of time. Um, so what's your predictions for this upcoming year? If we do manage to get a vaccine approved, um, how long will it ultimately really take to get everyone around the globe vaccinated? I think I read a statistic, it's 14 billion shots. Probably somewhere around there. I mean, if you think that um, most of these vaccines require a prime boost regimen that is two, two shots. Um, seven, seven and a half billion people on this planet, that's 15 billion shots. And so I think that what you are seeing is that it is a production and a logistics challenge to make sure that you have enough of the vaccine and that you have the logistical cold chain the distribution centers, the people who will administer the vaccines and the demand for vaccines, um, having taken into account the issue of vaccine confidence, the anti-vaxxers lobby, um, and so on and so forth. So I think it's gonna take at least a year, maybe even two, to get the vaccine into every one of the seven and a half billion people on this planet. And which countries are likely to be the next hot zones this upcoming year, in your opinion? I mean, we're seeing Europe now facing second wave infections, and we've also heard, you know, cases of reinfections of COVID-19. Well, first of all, I don't think that the reinfections are common. I think they're very rare. And I think that, you know, while case reports are very um, sort of eye-catching, I don't think that we should sort of overplay the importance of reinfections because we don't nearly understand enough about the immunology of this disease and that we really shouldn't take anecdotal case reports uh, as the norm as opposed to the exception. Um, so there is uh, that issue. And then in terms of, are we going to be able to see some attenuation of the pandemic. Um, I don't think that it's gonna stop uh, until we have most people protected in one way or another. Even though the first generation vaccines are, like, are unlikely to be sterilizing, what it would do is that it would dampen uh, the uh, activity because uh, you are actually looking at very complicated immunological intervention, that is vaccines, being administered at the population level. And the order in which that these are administered in terms of between countries, but also within countries, and then within different types of risk groups, I think all that needs to be taken into, in, 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 into account. Um, it's, it's not a trivial uh, uh, sort of uh, story that you can try to predict who's going to get the second wave, the third wave, or the fourth wave. Um, I think that a lot depends on what governments do with the implied consent of the people. Um, and so much of this is preventable. And we have seen very successful examples, even beyond island countries, uh, to see this being uh, you know, controlled and controlled well. So if you say that Hong Kong, Singapore, uh, Taiwan, um, Australia, New Zealand, these are all island 
economies, uh, you know, some are very, very large islands like Australia, some are very, very small islands like Hong Kong. Uh, but, um, you know, you can look at Vietnam, you can look at South Korea, you can look at China. Um, and, you know, these places have all controlled uh, their uh, outbreaks much better than others. And so I don't think that it's something that is just uh, what Mother Nature, uh, uh, you know, deals uh, to different places. A lot of it depends on the collective um, sort of consent of the people to be adherent to good policies by governments. Now, the majority of our audience here are journalists. You know, as an epidemiologist, you've probably seen, you know, since this pandemic has happened, a lot of different types of reporting about the virus, about its spread. You know, one of the biggest problems facing many countries, for example, is also the spread of misinformation. What advice here would you have to give the journalists who are covering this pandemic into the upcoming year? And in your opinion, where should they be focusing their reporting efforts into 2021? Well, I believe in a free press, so I'm not going to sort of even dare suggest what should or should not appear in the media. What I would suggest is um, follow the right people on Twitter. Um, and uh, the Twitter sphere, uh, although it's vast and although there is an infodemic uh, in the Twitter sphere, just as everywhere else, but there are some real gems and the uh, Twitter commentariat, I think can be harnessed to good use. Um, and if you follow the right people um, and if you've been following the right people, I think you will find what is uh, science and what is pseudoscience and what is politics. That's a very good piece of advice. And just a, a reminder to some of the journalists who are joining us today, if you haven't checked out our Knight Fellow, Sergio Spagnuolo's project, sciencepulse.org, he's actually been trying to filter legitimate scientists onto like a single page where you can actually have a full set of their Twitter feeds. So do check out sciencepulse.org. Now we're going to be taking some audience questions. So if you're in the Zoom chat, like please type your questions in the chat and I'll try to get to, to as many of them as I possibly can. Now, one question that was emailed to us yesterday, um, Xin Yao, thank you so much for your questions. You sent us some really wonderful ones, um, but this one is quite good. And you mentioned that, you know, you are a proponent of the free press and you're not one to say what a journalist should be reporting on or not reporting on. But Xin Yao asks, in your opinion, in the current epidemic environment and social environment, how should journalists carry out their work you know, fighting this pandemic, specifically whether the content of the reports should meet the requirements of the authorities and be concealed to avoid panic? Or is it correct for us to report um, any information or details about this pandemic? And we've also gotten that question a lot in our previous webinars where some journalists fear spreading unnecessary panic. You know, where is the balance between we're reporting facts versus, you know, we're going to panic the public? Well, I think that, you know, report good science. Let science lead the way. The only exit from COVID is science. And I think that, you know, we all have our parts to play. Um, scientists go in the labs, go on their, uh, you know, AI computers, and we try and figure out what the truth is in terms of the science and unraveling the true natural behavior of the host of the vectors of the agent, which together makes a pandemic. Uh, so we go and seek truth through what we know best, and that is different scientific methods. And you go and seek the truth or reveal the truth um, through covering good science. And I think that science will lead the way. Um, and whatever we do in the labs, Whatever we do by the bedside is not going to get to the general public um, unless we have uh, journalists uh, do your part as well. So I think that we can be great partners and we've seen a lot of very good scientific journalism. 
Uh, and I think that, you know, if we all play our parts, then we might have a fighting chance. Excellent. And here's another audience question. And I haven't read the Jon Snow memorandum, but someone is asking about this. Could you please elaborate on the ineffectiveness of shielding the vulnerable strategy mentioned in the Jon Snow memorandum? Well, I think that the Jon Snow memorandum, I mean, I, I mean, I think, let's be honest, I think it was a direct um, riposte to the Great Barrington De Declaration. Um, and I think that if you read every word and pass it very, very carefully, you will see um, a, a lot of deep uh, insights and messages, uh, including the, decla the, 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 the declaration of, uh, of potential conflicts of interest in the Jon Snow uh, memorandum. So I would just encourage you to go and compare, um, um, you know, uh, and, and, and try and read quite deeply in it um, and see for yourselves. Now, uh, let, let me just say that I did not, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I was not involved in the drafting of the John Snow Memorandum. Uh, and in fact, uh, I, 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 you will not find my name there, but I do subscribe uh, to the views as expressed there. So I'm not pushing it because I'm part of it, but I'm, I, I think that it is a very interesting and very well-crafted uh, response. And there's another question here from our forum member, Carol, and she's asking, she wants you to elaborate a bit about the potential of COVID-19 becoming endemic. And she asks, at what point have we crossed the threshold where COVID-19 is not eradicable? Um, and this is probably going to stay with us even if we did get a vaccine and immunized everyone. Well, from the current state of science and from my um, experience dealing with global outbreaks and pandemics, um, if I have to be dichotomized into saying, yes, it's going to stay with us, or no, it, we can still eradicate it, I would tend to go with the former. I don't think that we can drive this back into the wild. And the reasons uh, are probably best expressed in a couple of pieces of work published in science. One that was just uploaded within the last 24 hours is Jeff Shaman's um, uh, perspective piece uh, in science. And he lays out sort of, I think, four key determinants of you know, what's going to happen next with the virus. Um, and then there is a very good model uh, by Mark Lipsitch uh, and his group uh, that appeared in Science of what, uh, two, three months ago. Uh, so I think that those two are very, very good pieces uh, to explain why a lot of us, or even most of us, think that we're going to have to live with um, this particular bug, SARS CoV 2, uh, for a very long time to come. It might well become the fifth uh, seasonal human coronavirus. Um, but this is not SARS uh, that could have uh, be driven back into the wild. And even for MERS, we've been, uh, you know, we've been living with MERS, uh, albeit in, a, in, 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 in quite a contained part of the world. Um, and that still has not completely ended yet. Wow. Well, that's unfortunately the, the, the factual outlook. Um, Disha Shati from India says countries like India with a massive COVID-19 load are opening up. For most of the poor and vulnerable, staying home is no longer an option. There's a lot of pressure to open up public spaces as well. What do you think is the way forward? And it's not just India, you know, we have a lot of countries struggling with sort of the balance that they need to get their economies going. They can't have people out of work or small businesses shutting down with with lockdowns, um, do you think there is some middle way, so to speak, when it comes to still managing everyday life and opening up versus you know, total lockdowns in order to prevent the spread of the virus? I don't think it's black or white. I don't think it's a dichotomy. I don't think that we should be uh, sort of doing trade-offs between lives and livelihoods. I think that's a false dichotomy. Uh, what I do think is that the perennial three-way tug of war 
that is between health protection, economic preservation, and the implied social consent or the emotional well-being uh, and the willingness to comply of the public, that three-way tug of war is going to be with us for a very, very long time. Um, and it is in that three-way tug of war that we need to, number one, use science to explicate the trade-offs and then come to some consensus as a society. Of course, it, that consensus needs to be forged and facilitated by government, but ultimately it is a societal decision um, as to at that particular point in time, what would be the trade-offs that we'll be making quite explicitly going in and then we'll have to try that out and then we would have to be ready to switch our positions when the situation changes. And I think that is the way to go. That is the healthy way to go. Now, to be in perennial lockdown for the next 9, 12, 15, 18 months, that's not, that's not reasonable, nor should it become even conceivable. What we need to do is to find a way that we can maintain some degree, probably not 100% compared to pre-COVID levels, but let's find some degree of um, normality in societal functioning and then try to be innovative um, and try to do things that we haven't been doing before, try new ways like using this Zoom platform. Um, and, you know, can you imagine in the old days if we wanted to do this, uh, it would be so, such an expensive, uh, both financially as well as to, uh, to, to climate change, uh, you know, decrements to fly everybody in and to do this. And you wouldn't be able to have nearly the reach that you are having now. Um, so I think that that's the kind of spirit we need to have. Um, number one, to keep healthy, two, to keep sane. And bouncing off of that, and this is the question I have personally, since, you know, around March, February, we've been seeing like many different countries respond to this pandemic very differently, some more successful than others. Do you think, and really it's on a case by case basis, right? Because, you know, there's certain societal factors that determine, you know, how, how a virus spreads. But out of the cases that you, you've been seeing, which ones have been most successful and why, in your opinion? Successful in terms of what, sorry? Of stemming the spread of the virus. I mean, I've given you a whole list of uh, places which have, uh, you know, demonstrably done relatively much better than other places. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's, it's a combination of preparedness. It's a combination of um, investment in the public health infrastructure. I think it's also a combination of political leadership. And I think it's also uh, a, a combination of the uh, sort of disposition of the people. Um, and if you look at places that had experienced SARS, um, I think that, you know, that indelible sociological imprint of SARS um, have made the, the populations uh, respond in a rather different way compared to other places who haven't had that baptism by fire, shall mm -hmm. we say. Um, but I think that political leadership has a lot to do with it as well. I think that, you know, um, the, the, I mean, taking sort of the broader determinants, if you're looking at, you know, the, the geopolitical landscape, if you're looking at national politics, um, if you're looking at disparities, which have been simmering to a boil, uh, certainly in the last few years, um, in particular, uh, if you're looking at, you know, the sort of extreme positions of nationalism, populism, even tribalism in many places, I think that those are all sort of uh, socio-political and economic determinants which ultimately drive behavior. And therefore, that, that, that equilibrium of the three-way tug of war that I had been uh, talking about uh, has resulted into different um, out outcomes. 
Here's a question from Barbara Fraser, a bit on the same note. Um, she asks, assuming COVID-19 does become endemic, the fifth seasonal coronavirus, as you say, what should countries, especially those whose health systems have been proven to be weak, do to prepare? And how should they go about preparing their health systems and their populations for it? What should their priority be? Well, I think that the priority would be, I mean, I think the real litmus test going forward is the procurement and the distribution of vaccines. It will say a lot about countries and it will say a lot about the people uh, in terms of the fair allocation of vaccines, uh, both between countries and within countries. It will say a lot about our common humanity. It will say a lot about multilateralism. It will say, say a lot about global geopolitics. Um, uh, I mean, going into uh, the next half of the COVID outbreak, um, we start from a position where in the last 10 months since COVID emerged, uh, we start from a position where we are looking already at the gravest health inequity caused by a single event in the past century. A lot of it was by omission rather than commission. So going into the vaccine allocation and distribution issue, if we're already starting from that premise, surely we owe it to everyone, but particularly those less advantaged, um, the responsibility to make sure that at the global to the village level that we have fair allocation. And that I think will say a lot about our common humanity at every level. So actually a bit on that topic, because you know that has been something people have been asking. When you talk about the fair allocation of vaccines, and I 100% agree with you on this, but how do you think the decision making is going to pan out on that? Because you know, I'm not sure which company is ahead in the race of producing a COVID-19 vaccine, vaccine and getting it approved. But once it is approved, I mean, how is that going to be determined on the global level as to which countries get prioritized in getting the distribution of vaccines first? Um, I think that there is a very good article uh, that's written by Zeke Emanuel, Ram Emanuel's brother, by the way, He's a uh, professor of medicine and philosophy and ethics at UPenn. It's published in Science, I think about a month ago. Um, and uh, I think that he's laid out uh, a very reasonable framework. Uh, of course, the US National Academy of Medicine uh, also uh, came out with a very, very comprehensive vaccine allocation document. It's freely available on their website. Uh, and similarly, um, other uh, countries have done similar policy documents. I think that, you know, just pick up one of them and just take a look. Um, but I uh, have been very impressed by, by uh, Zeke's um, uh, contribution uh, in, this, in, in, in science. And this is also, here's a local question. It comes from, from Jin Yao again. Um, he says, and this is about Hong Kong specifically, he said Hong Kong has 17 government approved institutions to do the nucleic acid test and the price ranges from 985 Hong Kong dollars to 3200 Hong Kong dollars. Do you think the price is too high for ordinary people and should the government offer a subsidy to it and maybe on a more global level? Um, so when we talk about, for example, economic disparities and inequalities, when it comes to testing, for example, or potentially in the future vaccines, you know, what the prices of those vaccines are going to be, you know, where is the government role in making these, these things, tests and vaccines, you know, widely available ultimately? And should they be providing subsidies this for these, these items for people who are at a lower economic level on the scale? Well, first of all, uh, let me just clarify the Hong Kong situation first. Yes, Hong Kong has, uh, has a dual uh, or mixed medical economy. There is the private sector, there's a the public sector. Uh, the public sector 
uh, is the predominant provider, certainly in cases of outbreaks, including COVID-19. And there are uh, some uh, just shy of 50 public outpatient clinics, which actually offers COVID testing, the gold standard PCR for free. Um, and uh, it's widely accessible. So there are 50 of these clinics all over Hong Kong and it's free testing. If you choose to go to the private sector, of course, then you get a variety of different prices. And yes, I do think that those are very best, but um, you know, personally, uh, unless there are uh, very, very extenuating circumstances, um, I, I really don't see any reason uh, why uh, anybody would go to seek uh, testing in the private sector uh, as opposed to the public sector uh, because of such a huge price differential. Uh, secondly, I think that, you know, uh, testing and scaled or scalable testing is a key to making sure that we can, uh, you know, relax some of the physical distancing measures, the so-called lockdowns or semi-lockdowns. Um, and that's one way that science has taught us to try and get us out of unsustainable lockdowns. Um, but the testing has to be timely. And by timely, I mean, you better get your result within a day, maximum two, because otherwise, by the time your results come back, and then you try to do isolation and quarantine of contacts, it doesn't work, it's too late. That's the nature of the disease spread. Um, and secondly, there is now a variety of different testing platforms and within each platform, there are many choices to choose from. Um, and I think that, you know, we still have not exploited the different platforms uh, sufficiently. And uh, people like Michael Mina from Harvard uh, have written extensively on it and given interviews on it. And I think that, you know, uh, people would be wise to listen to some of his insights. There's been sort of another question that we've been getting on on some of these webinar series. And one of them is where is the line between a government taking what is, you know, a legitimate, having a legitimate public health response versus maintaining democracy? Um, I remember early on during the pandemic that some countries took maybe what amounted or what we kind of considered draconian measures um, in order to prevent the spread of the virus. Do you think that there is any legitimate reason for a government to, to take draconian measures as necessary? Are they effective? Or at the end of the day, that we shouldn't be sacrificing democratic values in our public health responses? Well, I think that, look, I don't think there is, again, I don't think that there should be a false dichotomy between um, public health control measures, which some may label as draconian, um, uh, and uh, liberal democracy. Um, I don't think that there is necessarily a, 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 a sort of wall between the two. Uh, I don't think the sort of uh, aphorism of near the twain shall meet uh, should be applied there. I don't think there is any necessary conflict. Public health inherently is a collective business. Public health is about the health of the people, of whole populations as opposed to individuals. So what public health practitioners like me look at is the overall health and also importantly, the distribution of that health amongst different people in a population. So that is the public health approach. And unfortunately, given the so-called, what economists would call externalities of infectious diseases, or what epidemiologists or doctors would call the infectiousness of these conditions. It's not just you who is uh, sick and therefore suffer all the consequences. It's you in relation to people around you, people you come in contact with, and people who may then catch the disease from you. And it is because of that that we have public health regulations, whether you're talking about totalitarian systems or the freest economies in the world. All the statues in public health control of infectious diseases have some degree of um, 
putting the public's health over individual will under the appropriate circumstances. And that's just part and parcel of being responsible. Uh, so I don't think that there is a false dichotomy. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think that false dichotomy of being authoritarian or being draconian or being collective uh, and then being a democracy. I, I, I don't really subscribe to that notion at all. I see. Are there any more questions from the audience? I just want to check before we close out. If anyone has anything else, please throw it on the Zoom chat. Oh, doesn't seem like they do. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Gabriel, and for sharing your insights and your outlooks for 2021. Um, and again, a very public thanks to our forum members, Ying Cheng and Kevin Lau for connecting us to Gabriel. To everyone else, the latest news is that we've released our journalism and the pandemic survey. You can go check that out on www.icfj.org or on the ICFJ Global Health Crisis Reporting Forum group on Facebook. Please stay tuned for next week. We're hosting a very special post-tribute event, a Q&A with us, ICFJ. And please stay safe and see you again next time. And Gabriel, thank you so much for joining us. Um, if you have any final remarks to give the journalists here, please, please do before you sign off. No, I just want to say that, you know, journalists are so, so important. And you have been such champions of public health and global public health. Um, scientists can't do it alone. Clinicians can't do it alone. Um, you are no less important, and in fact, probably much more important than many of us who work in a different sphere. It is only through you that we can use our power of persuasion, magnified through you, to exit from this pandemic safely and expeditiously. So please know that we are in solidarity with you and also without your help and contribution, we will not be able to get out of COVID-19 um, nearly as safely uh, and as healthily as we might otherwise be. So please keep on doing your good work uh, and in partnership with my colleagues. Uh, I thank you uh, for all your service. And thank you, Gabriel, for sharing your expertise with all the reporters here today. And no doubt, if they want to get in touch with you, they can contact the communications people at Hong Kong University. Thank you.